Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this third of the Adversarial Studies Seminars. So far, the series has looked at Russia and Chinese air defences and Iranian command and control for proxy warfare. Today's session is looking at how China integrates economic and diplomatic lines of activity alongside the use of its military. And I'm delighted to have Dr. Siddharth Kaushal as our speaker today. This work builds on his excellent uh, writings in relation to the future conflict operating environment. And so I think we'll have an interesting conversation this morning. Uh, Sid will speak for approximately 20 minutes. He'll speak on the record. And then there'll be Q&A for approximately 20 minutes after that. The Q&A will be off the record. If you would like to ask any questions, then down towards the bottom center of your screen, there is a Q&A button. If you'd like to record your question there, then I will identify that and I'll be able to pose that question to Sid once, we have, uh, once we've heard his, his initial remarks. Uh, there are also some further instructions for you on the webinar guide in front of you now, if you have any difficulty in seeing the slides and the video. So, Sid, I'm really delighted you're going to be joining us today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. So if I can pass over to you for about 20 minutes on the record conversation. Thank you. Right. Well, thanks very much, Paul. So the, uh, the big question, really, uh, that uh, is driving uh, today's lecture, today's conversation, is this growing emphasis we see in strategic literature on the idea of cross-domain coercion, hybridity. We have a sort of growing cornucopia of terms for what uh, amounts to a general realization that uh, sort of deterrence and coercion moving forward will re will represent a whole of government effort which will ent integrate elements of economic diplomatic and informational tools alongside traditional uh, military assets uh, what i intend this lecture to be is kind of a bridge between that general realization and more sort of direct operational concepts in other words trying to look at how these different tools interrelate what circumstances lead to them producing a whole that is a bit more than the sum of their parts uh, when they might counteract each other and uh, when do they and uh, when and to what extent do they actually matter and for a variety of reasons i'll run through uh, over the course of this china represents a very interesting case study in this vein so i mean the big question is do economic tools really matter uh, there's a good deal of evidence to suggest the contrary uh, one major study of uh, economic sanctions over the course of the 20th century, for example, came to the conclusion that over 115 cases of sanctions, around five cases of coercive success could be identified. The, re the simple reason for it being that if people are willing to expend blood over something, they're usually willing to expend treasure over it. Uh, I'd argue that economic tools do matter uh, and that they can be uh, reasonably integrated into our understanding of coercion. Uh, but in order to fruitfully do this, we need to uh, overcome a few lacuna that have up until this juncture I'd, uh, somewhat hampered our understanding of the interplay between economic, diplomatic, informational, and military assets. The first, of course, is just a degree of conceptual siloing. These um, instruments are often viewed in opposition to one another as alternatives rather than instruments that can be used in a somewhat synthetic way. The second is uh, our criteria for success. Uh, so we tend to view the coercive utility of a given instrument in effects-based terms. Did it deliver a result or did it not? And I'd argue particularly for the non-kinetic instruments in a state's toolkit, rather than an effects-driven definition of success, we might better view them in their success or failure in situational terms. The degree to which they can frame the rules of competition, the uh, the grammar of engagement within which force is used rather than the degree to which they can actually substitute for force itself. Uh, the third issue, and uh, this is something we'll go through, is a somewhat black boxed uh, 
to put it one way, a sort of image of both the coerced and the coerced state. We tend to view governments as unitary actors rather than as networks of bureaucratic and societal actors. And this in some ways uh, hampers our understanding of precisely when and where uh, coercive instruments, particularly economic coercive instruments, can be quite useful. Now, the case of China is very instructive here, not because China always gets it right in terms of integrating the economic, military, and dip uh, diplomatic and informational components of strategy, but rather because over the course of the last 20 to 30 years, it's been experimenting with a variety of models to implement, uh, to integrate these tools and uh, produced a fairly broad range of both successful and uh, less successful attempts at integration. So it represents a fairly useful sort of empirical test bed for some of what we're going to talk about. So let's start with how we think about the state, uh, going back to the issue of black boxing. Uh, it's useful to think of the state less as a single unitary actor in terms of its decision makers and more as a sort of learning system. Uh, policy makers, uh, bureaucratic actors, and societal actors all have divergent, to, cer to a certain degree, organizational and social interests. They also tend to have beliefs that justify these interests. Now, I won't go through the entire flowchart, but what's the, the point of uh, this sort of idealized model of governmental learning is that it's a lot easier to reinforce existing beliefs or to produce marginal change by, by influencing one of the three major sort of components of a decision-making system, societal, bureaucratic, or governmental, than it is to actually produce a major change. In other words, it's easier to induce friction into a system, to slow down its rate of response, to potentially lead not to absolute inaction or coercive success in the sense of a system uh, uh, changing its views or, or its decision-makers changing their views and yielding to yours, uh, but rather it's easier to get them to adopt a model of competition that is uh, inimical to their own interests and perhaps beneficial to those of the coercers. So influencing the learning process, the process by which a uh, governmental system adapts to a challenge, uh, represents a more fruitful means of, influ uh, of influencing the grammar and rules of competition, particularly using things like diplomatic and informational tools, than uh, sort of attempts at direct coercion, which explains some of the divergence between the observed rate of direct coercive success on the one hand, which is quite poor, and the fact that states still do use economic tools. It's because rather than viewing them as substitutes for brute force, which can actually compel systemic change simply by producing a sort of an unequivocal result, uh, they tend to complement its use. They tend to frame its use. They tend to uh, mitigate, amongst other things, uh, the fallout from its use in terms of blowback, systemic balancing and the ways in which an adversary uh, frames a competition. Now, China, as a, we've said, now, how does this uh, link to um, China? Well, China is an interesting case here because it's a country with a relatively coherent strategic vision, one that's uh, been a rather long-standing one, uh, and one that actually does delineate quite effectively the roles of various tools in an, into an overarching uh, framework, but also one that's had a rather ad hoc approach to implementation that's often been characterized as much by experimentation as by any sort of grand plan. But there are some basic principles of uh, China's view, uh, worldview uh, since roughly the 1990s that have stayed broadly consistent. The idea that the world is inevitably trending towards multipolarity in which China will have a role. The idea that this will produce instability and a certain degree of conflict in an almost deterministic way. And the idea that the role of policy is not so much to avoid uh, these conflicts, which may represent wayposts on, the, on China's trajectory to its inevitable rise, but rather to localize them to prevent balancing effects, to prevent conflicts taking on a regional or even an extra regional uh, sort of character. And uh, this quote from um, the uh, uh, Science of Military Strategy, a, a doctrinal, uh, a piece of doctrinal literature from uh, the PLA kind of illustrates that point. 
Now, why this is relevant is because it really does delineate how economic statecraft plays into uh, the Chinese strategic re uh, vision and its relationship uh, to the use of force. It's not a substitute for the use of force, as we often you know, tend to hear. Uh, it's not necessarily a means by which one can win without fighting. Rather, it's a way of reinforcing uh, models of competition in an adversary's decision-making system that are favorable to one's own preferred mode of engagement in conflict, namely localized, short, sharp, high intensity conflicts. So when you look at, for example, uh, of things like the economic engagement of multilateral groupings like ASEAN, certainly there are perfectly valid uh, economic rationales for uh, engaging a fairly large uh, block on its own merits. I'm not suggesting everything in this context is driven by geopolitics, but certainly Chinese discussions of the geopolitical ramifications of this economic engagement is very much framed in terms of the idea that uh, an encircled state or a potentially encircled state has both comparative advantages and disadvantages. Its advantage being that it's swifter to mobilize than, for example, coalitions, multilateral institutions or groupings of nations that often have to work on a consensus principle and often tend towards a sort of a hedging dynamic or bilateral engagement uh, by individual nations if they can. The role of economic statecraft and the role of engagement in general is to do two things. To create within constituent member nations uh, coalitions of actors who have an interest in limiting the scope, scale, and degree of competition with China. And alongside this, you see two things. An informational outreach, uh, an approach to informational outreach that doesn't necessarily uh, always attempt to portray China as a benign rising hegemon. You know, uh, Chinese uh, diplomatic uh, sort of uh, communications are quite clear about their stand on their core national interests, for example, but rather uh, to communicate the image of China as a hegemon with limited regional interests, a uh, uh, not a, a rising power with limited regional interests one that can one whose actions on a bilateral basis with regards to for example an individual territory ought to be viewed on its own terms rather than as part of a pattern of wider uh, regional revisionism and one that can potentially be engaged uh, by for example multilateral groupings like ASEAN which very much feeds into these actors own self-perceptions, the idea that they can socialize a rising hegemon into, for example, accepting certain rules of the road. So in other words, the cumulative effect of economic and, and informational operations is not so much to either win over or coerce, particularly when it's been successful, uh, rather it's been to habituate uh, regional, part uh, regional uh, counterparts into a sort of a model of competition that's in line with this sort of local wars uh, framework. The idea that instability is a fact of life, but it can be mitigated, controlled, and channeled to strategic effect. So through the 1990s, uh, so you see kind of two major periods in terms of China's engagement of its periphery. And it should be said, a fair deal of heterogeneity in terms of how it engages individual countries and groupings. We've talked thus far in fairly broad terms, but we'll go into some of the details going forward. So through the 1990s, is, uh, one sees a pattern of what, uh, for example, ch uh, Chinese authors in the period call counter-containment, the, the major question for Chinese um, strategy in the period is how to, uh, on the one hand, continue China's inevitable rise whilst precluding, whilst achieving two complementary objectives, precluding uh, encircling coalitions from emerging and not giving up on what China uh, regards as its core national interests. And uh, the economic component of this strategy through this period is might broadly be termed as engagement. So in, it's in this period that China, for example, uh, abstains from engaging in competitive devaluation during the Asian financial crisis of 1997. It sees restrictions on trade and investment, both in a cross-strait uh, uh, context and vis-a-vis -vis Southeast Asia uh, lifted. And you see uh, increasing Chinese engagement with uh, regional multilateral groupings, for example, 
the ASEAN plus three framework or the Asian regional forum. However, something that is beginning to emerge, a dynamic that is beginning to emerge in this period, and something that was noted by scholars at the time, uh, like Michael Leifer, was the question of who socializes who. So the ASEAN vision of itself is very much one that by virtue of being an economic partner, by virtue of being a multilateral grouping, can slowly, uh, it can slowly socialize China into accepting rules of the road, uh, holding out the prospect of further cooperation for Chinese socialization into specific rules. Increasingly, what you see, however, is that this dynamic is reversed. Uh, formal acceptance in principle of the idea of rules of the road and economic engagement is held out as a basis by China for effectively dampening, slowing, and to some degree, uh, completely mitigating uh, an ASEAN response to both its rise and a uh, Southeast Asian response to both its rise and some of the coercive effects of its rise that you see in the next decade. In other words, it uh, a combination of economic engagement on the one hand and holding out a model of competition one where, which in some ways plays into Southeast Asian leaders' vision of themselves as potentially being able to socialize a larger power into accepting certain rules of the, of the road, actually gets them to accept a vision of China that is not starry-eyed. They see it as a potential competitor, but is uh, very much in line with the way China would like to portray itself, a rising power that potentially represents a challenge in some areas, but which has very limited calibrated interests. In other words, to go back to the uh, sort of idealized model earlier, uh, the combination of diplomatic and economic engagement introduces a degree of friction into the governmental learning process in uh, Southeast Asian states. As we were saying, it's a lot easier to slow down a process than it is to channel it towards or, or to uh, channel it towards one of several already acceptable outcomes within a state than it is to, for example, coerce a state to accept an altogether unacceptable outcome. In that sense, stasis is easier than change. It's also in the same period, however, that you see the beginnings of a more directly coercive uh, approach towards some entities or some countries. And you see this in the context of the Taiwan Straits crisis, for example, where uh, following uh, pre state, uh, President Li Tenghui, then President Li Tenghui's uh, visit to the United States, you see weeks of uh, missile tests near Taiwan by the PLA. Uh, going through the late 90s and the early 2000s, you see this matched by an economic approach that attempts to leverage the uh, dependence of the Taisheng, uh, sort of businessmen who are increasingly uh, from Taiwan, who are increasingly dependent on China to achieve political results. And you see this in the elections of 2000 and 2004, where uh, Taiwanese companies like uh, Acer, who's uh, chief executives are seen as being too close to candidates that China regards as being um, separatist are increasingly targeted on the mainland. Now this yields mixed results. On the one hand, see uh, many CEOs, many Taisheng in, China, uh, in Taiwan who are affected by this do try to keep their heads low, do try to avoid the mainland's wrath uh, following uh, this sort of bout of coercion, but what you don't necessarily see is outright political results. And in, the, uh, in Taiwan, in both uh, cases, China doesn't get the result it wants. And in fact, um, you know, in some ways, uh, this sort of uh, direct coercion creates a degree of skepticism or hostility towards um, the mainland as, for example, an economic uh, opportunity. It makes the case a lot harder to make in Taiwan for people who see things that way. But what I'm uh, basically trying to make the case for here is by the late 1990s, you see a sort of a twin track model of economic engagement emerge almost in perfect lockstep with a twin track model of military development. So on the economic front, you see increasingly engagement of actors whose interests in a given conflict are peripheral so as to introduce a degree of friction into their threat and uh, introduce a degree of friction into how quickly they update their threat uh, assessment processes uh, to uh, preclude region-wide balancing, to localize issues and to isolate regional targets. And you see more direct coercion 
vis-a-vis -vis targets themselves. And this very much matches, you know, the PLA's military development, which kind of uh, really uh, sort of begins to gather pace during the 1990s, which focuses on things like long range standoff capabilities to hold distant adversaries, not at complete risk, but to introduce a degree of uncertainty into their decision making process to raise the, qu the question of whether a response can be effectively mobilized and emphasizes local preponderance in the sort of short, sharp local wars framework we've talked about vis-a-vis -vis isolated regional targets. So there is a rough coherence that is emerging across the spectrum of Chinese policymaking in this period, not necessarily because of direct state-led integration. In fact, a lot of policymaking is decentralized in this period, but rather because in conceptual and doctrinal terms, a lot of the different uh, bureaucratic entities uh, are on the same page, you might say. So that takes us uh, to the second uh, phase, which is the 2000s to roughly the present, where you see a sort of crystallization of this approach that one uh, uh, sort of sees in the 1990s, a, slow, a sort of slow but steady attempt at slowing down regional responses uh, to uh, individual acts of calibrated revisionism, coupled with, uh, dipl uh, uh, coupled with more direct coercion vis-a-vis -vis isolated targets. Uh, it should be said though that uh, we should be uh, careful not to uh, completely generalize. There is a degree of unevenness in uh, application uh, during this period. For example, you see a much uh, greater linkage of economics and geopolitics in Southeast Asia, for example, uh, versus the so-called formula of uh, hot economics, cold politics, in other words, separating the two issues that's outlined vis-a-vis -vis Japan as a sort of freeze begins to develop uh, during the uh, in the relationships between these two countries in the um, in the period lead, uh, in the late uh, the early 2010s. Um, and what you tend to see during this period is precisely where and when this uh, China's approaches are most effective, where they aren't, and what this tells us perhaps about the role of economic tools in uh, as a sort of a complement to military force more generally. So I'd like to point to two particular sort of cases as being of, uh, of uh, specific importance. Uh, so the first would be the Scarborough Shoals incident in 2012 where uh, after a series of uh, clashes between uh, Chinese fishermen and civilian coast guards, you see a growing Chinese initially governmental then para and then paramilitary uh, presence in the region uh, with uh, military vessels uh, of the PLA itself held uh, directly over the horizon. Now, what's interesting about uh, the Scarborough Shoals incident is that it happens just before that year's ASEAN meeting in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And uh, just as the meeting is about to commence, uh, the host nation, which also is the chair and agenda setter for the meeting, uh, receives a rather uh, generous and uh, offer and um, no strings attached uh, loan from the PRC, something that results in the Scarborough Shoals issue effectively being shelved. What simultaneously, other mem uh, simultaneously, other members of uh, ASEAN are engaged bilaterally to point to uh, several factors. One, the idea that this is an isolated territorial claim, a core national interest that doesn't necessarily represent a wider regional approach, even, uh, even as, of course, the nine dash line uh, would suggest otherwise, uh, but also uh, engaged on the point, uh, but also simultaneously, um, the use of uh, military and paramilitary assets is coordinated, military assets staying very well over the horizon and sort of quasi civilian assets uh, taking, taking the lead to sort of dampen uh, the regional reaction, to dampen regional threat perceptions. So what uh, economic uh, information and uh, diplomatic tools do here is not necessarily present China as the good guy, not necessarily win hearts and minds, or necessarily directly coerce, but to shape the agenda, to uh, take it off the table as a multilateral consideration for ASEAN as a whole to frame it as potentially a conflagration of limited scope and scale that represents a limited problem. In other words, it presents the region with a model of competition, one that I'd argue it's at, that the ASEAN countries have by and large accepted, 
that is more or less in line with China's overarching strategic vision. Uh, it's in the same context, however, the approach to the Philippines itself is much more directly coercive, you know, sanctions on, uh, or ta uh, sort of, in, um, you might say informal uh, restrictions on fruit exports from the Philippines uh, tend to uh, follow the Scarborough Shoals issue. And it's interesting to note that where economic tools are used as a shaping device to make it easier to use military and paramilitary assets, uh, you tend to see results. They tend to be quite effective at limiting the blowback that one tends to see every time uh, one uses force, the sort of the negative second order effects. Uh, that uh, necessarily follow its use, whereas direct coercion against the Philippine government actually doesn't work. It doesn't uh, compel the uh, the government of the day uh, to change any of its major policies on territorial disputes or the internationalization of them. And in fact, it's only with a change of government for reasons largely internal that we see uh, a change in the Philippines on that front. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Vietnam, you see uh, a similar dynamic and also a, a rather novel use of uh, economic assets, which uh, perhaps might hold out uh, some clues into how they might uh, buttress the use of military force uh, going forward. So uh, from 2014 onwards, you see HSY uh, 981, a, a deep drilling uh, exploration, uh, uh, an oil rig, uh, sort of uh, deployed to disputed waters relatively close to Vietnam's coast uh, with the backing of the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia, Coast Guard, and uh, again with the Navy hole uh, hovering over the horizon. Uh, now at the time, the then head of the CNOC, the uh, Chinese state-owned oil company, uh, describes uh, HSY 9, uh, 981 as being effectively floating national territory. And you can see why it, the, uh, something like that really a, a major civilian asset really does change the contours of a competition. Not only does it have its obvious symbolic importance in terms of holding, uh, in terms of laying a claim, but it raises the specter that in any major conflagration, damage done to a civilian asset of some worth uh, can indeed uh, can drag the smaller actor into a, a cycle of escalation uh, it might not be uh, entirely comfortable with. In other words, uh, the use of civilian assets and paramilitary assets at the forefront and indeed the use of economic tools as a sort of a messaging device uh, does change to some degree the structure of the competition, limits uh, uh, target states options. However, at the same uh, juncture, uh, China well, uh, it declares it wishes to shelve the uh, prospect of joint exploration, but declares uh, over the course of the years that it's open to it. It is, it engages and over, it has engaged over the last several years, I should say, ASEAN over a code of conduct in the South China Sea, although it refuses to commit to a binding declaration and tends to be more willing to commit to the process rather than the outcome per se and has continued uh, with a no strings attached mod uh, model of um, aid and uh, investment for countries that might regard this as peripheral. Uh, projects like the Jakarta Bandung Railway and uh, BRI investment in uh, Malaysia, for example, uh, continue apace during this period. And what this does in many ways is again, it socializes actors into seeing conflicts with China in bilateral terms and also in limited terms. Vietnam itself, for example, simultaneously describes uh, China's uh, acts against its territory as unacceptable, what it regards as its territory as unacceptable, but describes it also as a, comp as a comprehensive partner. It, uh, in, in other words, it's adopted a language of balancing limited competition and cooperation that's very much along the lines that Chinese leaders have uh, proposed. Elsewhere, countries like Indonesia certainly are willing to defend their own territory fairly assertively, but don't see this as being necessarily a multilateral consideration. In other words, the effect of the cumulative uh, sort of Chinese uh, effort across domains has not necessarily been to radically change ASEAN, uh, the Southeast Asian sort of political balance, but rather to reinforce many tendencies that preclude a region-wide response that turn its disputes with the region, at least in the way regional leaders frame it to themselves, into a series of bilateral 
competitive disputes, which is very much the way uh, China is comfortable with it. So economic tools are really at their most useful in this context when they set, the, uh, and diplomatic tools, I should say, and the use of paramilitary assets when they set the rules of the competition and frame the context in which force might be used rather than as direct coercive tools themselves. And this goes back to the point about, you know, uh, defining efficiency in terms of situational results rather than effects. And where uh, China's sort of approach does focus on effects, um, in where it's more directly coercive, uh, you tend to see the major failures of um, Chinese um, economic statecraft. Uh, one can see this, for example, in terms of attempts at cross-strait engagement, which are scuppered largely by suspicion of uh, the PRC uh, in terms of a uh, sort of financial and uh, economic integration with uh, Taiwan. Uh, we see this in the tacit threat that uh, the PRC may potentially have made uh, to the United States following uh, arms shipments uh, to Taiwan in uh, 2010 to reassess the degree to which it would be uh, sort of invested in dollar denominated assets vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, uh, a prospective rare, uh, sort of um, uh, stoppage of, uh, pardon me, of uh, rare earth exports in 2010 following a clash of the Senkakus, again, yields very little by way of coercive effect and a great deal of pushback, uh, although it should be said we actually are not entirely sure whether that were, that um, instant uh, was in fact a case of conscious coercive diplomacy and academic uh, opinion does uh, diverge on it. Uh, so in the, and even where you might point to partial successes, for example, in the uh, case of uh, South Korea uh, over TAD, where, you know, the current administration has committed to um, restrictions on uh, the scope and scale of its TAD batteries uh, following Chinese economic pressure and has uh, promised not to enter a regional uh, missile defense partnership with the US and Japan. Really, most of those concessions were things that the South Koreans probably would have regarded as difficult to do for domestic political reasons, irrespective of anything China has done. You find it very difficult to find cases of clear and outright direct coercive success. And this, I think, leads to a couple of final points that I'll make before wrapping up. Uh, the first point is that in many ways, you could almost, uh, and this is a point we made earlier, you could almost see uh, sort of China's economic engagement as being at its most useful when it complements the idea uh, as, uh, aspects of its military approach. Uh, particularly the sort of layered standoff capabil uh, capabilities by which it can, for example, preclude effective regional intervention by an extra regional actor like the US. The first arguably sort of invisible layer of China's anti-axis area denial capability you might see as its ability to short circuit a regional balancing response that would be necessary to create the political basis for turning a local war into something arguably larger, more region spanning and thereby more costly for China, uh, creating a political impulse to terminate hostilities quickly, which plays quite easily uh, into a, a strategy of a fait accompli. In other words, the, creating a regional climate, climate and a regional understanding of what the rules of competition are that are favorable to the way China wishes to frame a uh, competition and inimical to the way in which, for example, an extra regional actor like the US might wish to. Uh, the sort of development of the PLA's military assets, the sort of the long range strike assets, the, like the DF-21D, you might almost see as a second layer after, after its economic engagement, a way of introducing even more lag, even more uncertainty and even more friction into, a into an ex uh, region wide response process. And within the context that these sorts of tools uh, share, that sort of shape the sort of the cumulative effect of these kinetic and non-kinetic elements of non-contact warfare. It is possible for a regional power, particularly when it's a strong unitary actor, to um, mobilize quicker, more effectively, and achieve decisive results without necessarily producing a sort the sort of systemic blowback that it's uh, trying to uh, to avoid. Uh, so on that 
uh, just a final couple of points. Uh, it is worth pointing out uh, before I finish that it's important not to overstate the, um, the degree of centralization in, uh, for example, China's use of its uh, military and economic tools. Although there's a fair degree of conceptual integration, a lot of implementation has been fairly ad hoc. Uh, a lot of uh, coordination has often been achieved uh, in ex post facto by things, uh, by ad hoc uh, committees like foreign affairs or maritime rights leading small groups, which, uh, which was stood up to sort of rationalize policies across domains, uh, which perhaps in areas contradicted one another. Uh, but what you do see is a fairly a uh, consistent effort to leverage the externalities that are created by things like trade to strategic effect and a broad conceptual coherence between the sort of the military informational and uh, economic components of uh, Chinese strategy. You also see a record because of this ad hocry, because of this experimentation of success and failure that tells us something about how non-traditional security tools can be used when they're at their most useful. Uh, they're not a substitute as you know, theorists of hybrid warfare might claim for the use of force, uh, nor are they necessarily at their most useful as direct coercive tools, rather they're at their most useful at introducing, uh, at imposing a model of uh, competition upon an opponent, uh, setting the rules of the game within which force is used. In other words, you might to borrow from the Soviet strategic lexicon, see them as a tool of uh, reflexive control. And uh, that's my final uh, comment for the day. I'll turn over to you, Paul. Sid, thank you very much for